This video is brought to you by Surfshark. Safety and security online are critically important and you can protect yourself online with Surfshark. Get 83% off and three months for free through the link in the description below. And now today's video. Think back to the beginning of COVID-19. The pandemic hit, stores close, and governments tell you to stay inside. Don't go outside unless you really need to. You find yourself faced with a home lockdown that many are saying will last for a few weeks, maybe months. No way that it's gonna last for more than a year, right? Looking around, so you take inventory of all the things that you have in your home, food, clothes, toiletries, medicine, books, video games. This will surely get you through the next couple of weeks that this lockdown will last. No worries at all. Fast forward a week. Your groceries are running low because what else is there to do during a lockdown than binge TV while snacking on whatever is within reach? Plus, you need to find a great outfit to wear once everything opens back up. Your goal of learning guitar finally met a period in your life where there's enough time and you want to see what that air fryer craze is all about and then buy some home workout equipment that you will definitely 100% use, won't you? Luckily, the modern age has given us the miracle of online shopping. No need to go outside and risk exposure to COVID. All you need to do is a few taps on the keyboard, a couple of clicks of the mouse, and voila! All of the products that you could ever want, they're on the way to your door. Unluckily, checking your bank account balance is also just a couple of clicks away, so there's that. But that's a problem for future you. You spend the next couple of days waiting for your packages to arrive with the anticipation of a child on Christmas. And sure enough, a couple of days later, those boxes appear on your front porch. You think nothing of the process of how they got to you, why a product from across the world took only days to arrive, or how these products from all over the world don't take a heavier toll on your poor bank account. There was a time in history, in fact, an overwhelming majority of history, where purchases of international products like this were not so convenient and they were certainly not so cheap. Going all the way back to the early days of international trade, explorers, sailors, and merchants risked life and livelihood testing new boundaries, taming the waters of vast oceans, and traversing routes like the Silk Road to bring back goods from other parts of the world, goods that would be sold for more than a pretty penny. But even as recently as the start of the Industrial Revolution and even into the beginnings of the Digital Revolution, shipping goods across the world was no easy or cheap task. One simple invention changed the very nature of the commerce industry and allowed for hundreds of times more goods to make their way around the world. And that, of course, is today's subject, the shipping container. If international trade is a uh, human body, then transport is the body's veins. Ships, trucks, and trains are the blood cells, and the goods aboard, the oxygen that keeps the global body of trade alive. Until recently, these blood cells of trade and the goods they carried were, at best, a haphazard assortment of boxes, barrels, and crates, and at worst, an ineffective and dangerous medium of storage and transport. For goods to go from point A to point B, a variety of transport is needed, and each method of transport can accommodate different means of storage. Ancient Egyptians would ship wood, fabrics, and glass to Arabia via sacks on the backs of camels. Ancient Greeks would use a storage container called an amphora, basically a large pot with two handles and a long neck to transport wine, olive oil, and grain on ships between ports. Comparing these two modes of storage and transport, you could see how camels could not accommodate large jars full of liquid or grain very well, or how sacks of wood, glass, and fabric couldn't be stored on a ship in a way that effectively uses space, at least without damaging those goods. For much of international trade's history, storage and transport problems similar to these just persisted. Goods would be loaded in crates, barrels, boxes, sacks, and just any other type of storage container that was available or commonly used at the time. Loading these items from the carriages, trucks, animals, or trains onto the ships would often take weeks upon weeks of labor to complete. And the same goes for the process at the other end of the voyage. Dock workers would then unload the ships and pile the haphazardly stored goods into warehouses where they would wait to be loaded onto whatever method of land transport would take them to their final destination. That is, unless they had to empty the crates, barrels, sacks, and boxes of their goods and reload them into storage containers more suited for land travel. In between the two destinations, storage space on the transport would be poorly utilized. Sacks, crates, and barrels would be arranged as best they could, but there is only so far that you can arrange a sack and a barrel together 
to get an optimal use of space. This would lead to fewer goods being transported and weight and balance problems occurring during said transport. Now, all things considered, if you were to make the equivalent of an online purchase in the pre-shipping container era, your air fryer would only get to you several months later. And you'd be hoping that there'd be no damage that occurred along the way. In that case, it's got a long way home and a long way for a new one to reach you. It wasn't until World War II that someone decided to look into a more standardized way of storage. That someone was the US military. World War II spurred the minds of the US military to come up with a better way of transporting guns, bombs, ammunition, rations, and other materials to the front lines. Who would have thought that you've got a world war to thank for getting that air fryer to you sharpish? So, along comes Malcolm McLean. McLean was an entrepreneur in the 1950s in the United States who had the simple but hugely influential idea to standardize the size of shipping containers, not just for sea transport, but also to meet the needs of land and rail transport. He already owns a trucking company and had experience with the frustrations of transport storage and efficiency. In the 1950s, McLean bought a steamship company so that he could put his idea into practice. And that's when storage containers really set sail. Okay, we'll get back to today's video in just a second, but first, here's a message from today's sponsor, Surfshark. Do you use the internet? Yeah, you do. Do you have personal information that you'd rather remain personal? You bet. Who doesn't? Well, let me tell you something that you probably already know. The internet's a weird place. There are people out there trying to steal your personal information or track your Instagram habits to bombard you with creepily accurate ads. No one wants any of that stuff. Also, Surfshark have HackClock, which searches online for your passwords, and they let you know if they've been leaked somewhere, and you can change those passwords, and hey, you're nice and safe again. And when you're all nice and safe again, maybe you're like, oh, let's watch some Netflix, that'll be good, but you've watched everything in your Netflix queue, and you're like, well, that's disappointing. Tell you what, fire up Surfshark. Jump over to a different country through their VPN, and your streaming options will be a lot different. Loads of new stuff to check out. Surfshark's also totally unlimited, so you can download whatever you want. No worries. Right now, you can get 83% off and three extra months for free. At surfshark.deals forward slash side projects, or just follow the link in the description box below. And now, back to today's video. When McLean first patented his shipping container in the 1950s, his decision had each box at 33 feet long and 8 feet wide and tall. The length would soon be increased to 35 feet. The most commonly used size today is known as the 20-foot equivalent unit, or TEU. It measures 8 feet wide, 9 feet tall, and, you guessed it, 20 feet long. There are other sizes, 40 feet long, for example, or taller than 9 feet, but the width always stays constant at eight feet. The concept that makes these shipping containers so effective is surprisingly complex. To understand it requires an advanced knowledge of mathematics and physics that would confuse even experienced academics. That <laughs> No, it's actually really quite simple. The uniform size of the containers, unlike the mismatch haphazard dimensions of the myriad of storage methods before, could be loaded onto ships more easily while taking advantage of the ship's space better. After all, two rectangles can be stacked together much more efficiently than a barrel and a sack. It ain't complicated. These containers could be loaded onto ships like Legos, stacked neatly on top of each other. Huzzah! Perhaps the biggest benefit of the storage container was its translatability across any mode of transport, from massive shipping vessels piled high with thousands of them to trains with containers linked together for miles to semi-trucks hauling just a single container. The process of unloading containers and loading them onto the next mark transport had changed from weeks of manual labor to mere minutes of a crane lifting it up and then setting it down. There was no unpacking necessary since the shipping container fits all three modes of transport. One invention made just for McLean's new containers, known as the twist lock, improved something equally simple as the standard size box, a corner. As basic geometry will tell you, any cube has eight corners. The same goes for the standard shipping container. What the twist lock did was create a latch to put on each corner and a device that could fasten on these latches. The invention allowed many containers to be stacked on each other aboard ships, to be fastened to train cars or the beds of semi-trucks, and to be easily picked up and moved around by cranes. To make this simple idea work, though, McLean had to undergo some 
complex business maneuvering. In the beginning, the Interstate Commerce Commission would not allow a single person to own both a trucking and a shipping company. So McLean had to sell his trucking company and reinvest the capital, along with a hefty loan of $500 million, into making this idea the new normal. The next obstacle he faced was one of practicality. Ships, trucks, and ports had to be redesigned to accommodate McLean's containers. And here enters another invention, a modified trailer chassis that trucks could use to accommodate the containers. McLean also convinced the Port Authority of New York to build a port in New Jersey next to Port Newark, designed to handle its containers. This port became the example that countless other container-ready ports built in the future would follow. One of the biggest obstacles McLean had to overcome was the backlash from port workers. Since the containers cut down on the manual labor needed for loading and unloading at ports, longshoremen went on strike to save their jobs. It nearly drove McLean's newly founded Sealand Company to bankruptcy, but loans helped to keep the company afloat. Then the government stepped in and gave Sealand a big boost during the Vietnam War. When the military started experiencing backups at ports in South Vietnam in 1967, the US government put a large order in for McLean's standard shipping container to help unclog all of the mess. Shortly after, McLean decided to make his container available for use on a royalty-free basis to the International Organization for Standardization. Now, modern shipping more resembles the following scenario. Those dumbbells you ordered that definitely won't get the dust next to the TV are loaded into a shipping container at the warehouse in which they're manufactured. That container is transferred onto a train to make the rest of the journey to the coast, where it will be lifted by crane and stacked on a massive container ship for the voyage across the ocean. When it reaches port, that same container will be unloaded and attached to a truck or train where it will make its way to your local distribution warehouse. There it will finally be unloaded and packaged to make its way to your front porch. The impact of the shipping container ranges from faster shipping times and less manual labor to more cost effectiveness and more efficient use of space. Perhaps the best way to illustrate this impact is just by looking at the numbers. When the shipping container first started to be used on a large scale, it brought the price of loading cargo from $5.86 per ton to just 16 cents per ton. By the 1980s, 90% 90 of countries had container-ready ports, making the standard shipping container a staple in international shipping. The shipping industry continued to evolve and expand over the years, with bigger ships accommodating more containers and more cargo. In 1980, with about 90% of goods being shipped in these containers, these boxes carried around 102 million metric tons of goods. By 2017, the amount of container-carried cargo had skyrocketed to 1.83 billion, with a B, metric tons. Nowadays, 95% of all manufactured goods are shipped around the world in these containers. In 2017 alone, containers transported $4 trillion worth of products. These numbers didn't just happen by magic. In the last 20 years, the size of container ships has doubled, allowing the biggest among them to haul close to 24,000 containers. To put this sheer number of products into perspective, a similar container ship named the Globe can carry 19,100 containers, nearly 5,000 less than the largest ship. This still allows it to carry 156 million pairs of shoes, enough to lace up the entire population of Russia. It could hold 300 million tablets, enough to equip everyone in Mexico with two, or 900 million cans of baked beans, enough to meet the daily caloric needs of the entire of Japan with plenty left over. Shipping containers have even reinvented residential and commercial spaces. People have taken this standard-sized unit built to withstand extreme weather on the ocean and repurposed it as living in office spaces. But not all the containers' impact has been good. The explosion in size of container ships has led to economic crises like the ones caused by the Ever Given. Ships' massive sizes make it easier to get stuck in waterways such as the Suez Canal. The overloading of these already massive ships has also led to environmental crises. In the winter of 2020 to 2021 alone, 3,000 containers fell into the ocean, littering the ocean with their cargo and disrupting marine ecosystems. On May 20, 2021, cargo aboard a ship off the coast of Sri Lanka, including 25 tons of nitric acid, exploded and burned for days. This disaster led to plastic pollution covering Sri Lankan beaches. On November 30, 2020, the One Apis, a ship carrying goods from China to Los Angeles, lost 1,800 containers in waters 1,600 miles northwest of Hawaii. Some of the containers lost were carrying goods like batteries, fireworks, and liquid ethanol, which would have less than desirable effects on the ocean habitat. These examples stand out as the worst among their kinds, but there seems to be 
just no solution in sight yet. Ever since the pandemic, online shopping has increased, leading to a spike in overseas shipping. In April 2021, the National Retail Federation announced 10 straight months of record high imports from Asia to the United States West Coast. Problems associated with the stress on the shipping industry backed up ports, delayed delivery and container storage have become more common and are expected to continue in the future. This has led to more ships traveling the seas during the stormy fall and winter seasons to meet consumer demands, with 6,000 container ships on the ocean every day, transporting 226 million containers every year. It's easy to imagine how many accidents can happen and the scale of the environmental impact that they will have. The shipping container has transformed both the business and ecological environments. Considering the trends we see today and where they may lead, we can see the shipping container is likely to remain a mainstay of international shipping, both with its economic impact and its role in today's increased consumerism. What will be interesting, though, is what other out-of-the-box impacts this simple idea is going to have in store for us. So I really hope you found today's video interesting. If you did, please use that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. If you've got a suggestion for a future video, that's what the comment section is for. Sort of, in a way. I mean, you can use it for that. Thank you for watching.